Welcome to Never Shut Up. It's your boy, Marcel Swally. Boy, I love these Fridays when I still have my voice because that's about to come to an end. Uh, football starts next week. Uh, Coach Wiley, Phil Belichick is in the building, right? And yes, I am Phil Belichick because all we do is win, win, win in basketball and football. Nah, we got some little kids out there doing their dang thing, man. Appreciate you guys supporting me doing my dang thing. And make sure you go to projecttransition.org and log on. Leave a monthly donation to support these itty bitties and these little kids. We coaching up, developing in and out the classroom, and I'll hook you up with that book. All right, let's get into the show. That's what we do. Um, I've been saying this for so long, and who am I to say it? So I guess it hasn't hit home for everybody, but enough people. <sighs> I've been playing sports since 1979. I was a golfer. Yes. Look at me. Yes. Me, I was black then too. <laughs> Between Calvin Pete, see y'all don't even know who that is, and Tiger Woods, everybody know him, right? I was golfing when it wasn't cool to be golfing. Black people, <laughs> I was pre-Tiger Woods, right? And I remember golfing, and I didn't love the culture of golf. I really didn't know enough about it, but the initial like look at golf culture was ah too library for me, right? Too quiet. Oh, ooh, what is this? I didn't like the etiquette of it. So I gravitated to football and then I wanted to go to basketball because that's what we do and I wasn't good at it. So I said, that's not what I do. And I ran track. That was my sports bones right there. But I always watched basketball and I always looked at basketball and I had this like close watchful eye because a lot of my teammates played basketball and football with me. I played with some great basketball players. Tremaine Folks. If y'all don't know who Tremaine Folks is, just look him up. That was my running back. Like, we ran some kind of wing tee at times, and he would be the running back with me. I got the most carries. Can you believe that? I was more athletic than Tremaine Folks, for real. Uh, I got most carries, and then Tremaine would be like third. Who was second? James Gray, Gumby. People in L.A. know Gumby. I think he went to Fresno State. Um, but Gumby was all baller. They won state. So he won state basketball. This is all going to make sense at the end. He won state basketball, Westchester, with who? The Twins. The Ball Twins. Yes. The Ball Twins, the same uncles of LaMelo, LaVar's brothers. Who else is in there? So that's LaMelo's, uh, that's their uncle, uh, Lonzo, etc. Right? That whole Ball family I grew up with. Ain't that crazy? Them suckers were big then. It was like 10th grade. I'm like, dog, you eight feet already. Like, that's how it was. So, small world. But I knew hoopers. I knew hoopsters. I knew all of them, right? So, you grow up in these eras and you know the level of talent because you play with the talent that ends up making it or not. Stace Bozeman, another one, right? Now, Stace Bozeman was even more athletic than me. He had me beat. And then it was me. Stace Bozeman ran our league. Then it was me. Then it was Tremaine Folks, et cetera, right? You keep going. Deshaun Jackson came through there, et cetera, right? So I'm like, these hoopers out here, they balling, they balling. And then all of a sudden they got their flowers. That era got his flowers capped with Michael Jordan. Now, I know how these kids ball now because I coach them or I've been observant or I've been around it. And this era doesn't get the props that I thought it properly deserved. The LeBron era, if you want to go there, right? So I'm looking and I'm like, damn, don't they recognize how much more talented these guys are now than they were then? No, nah, no, nah, because it's Jordan. I'm like, yeah, I'm talking about the meat of the league. I'm talking about most guys, right? I'm talking about roster number four through eight. Y'all sure? Because a top dog in any era going to be a top dog. I'm talking about the, the whole kennel. <laughs> I'm talking about the litter. You know what I mean? And they, I just never understood it. And I was like, oh, maybe it's the nostalgia. Maybe it's just your era's better. Like my era of rap, 80s, 90s is better than 2000s, 2010s. And this, these kids now is like, nah, what you talking about, old man? What you talking about, Unk? All right. Why do I bring this up? Because finally, some people uh, with different voices are saying the same thing. We caught Phil Jackson recently supposedly, saying, uh, look at Jordan's era, look at LeBron's era. Of course you're going to talk about LeBron being the GOAT. He's playing against more talented, skilled guys. Was that a fake post or not? I don't know. 
but I know this one is real. Check out when they talk about the title of the most artificially inflated era in the NBA, and it's not right now. Is today's NBA objectively pure? Is this the purest form of basketball? Because we now have the statistical controls on the scorekeepers to fact check them in real time. Is the human element removed from the game? What do you think? I think the human element is appearing in a different form. The NBA knows, because they've done this with focus groups, they tell the viewers to dial up how much enjoyment you're getting out of watching a game. Right. People are dialing it up, their enjoyment, when there's high scoring, more scoring, right? So. Is there manipulation in today's NBA game? I don't think it's taken the form of a stack keeper on the sidelines. I think the manipulation comes in kind of like behind the scenes, like from up top. Right, like the league office deciding we want faster paced games that are more open. We're going to introduce freedom of movement rules so that Steph Curry can break free and get shots off. There's two inflations we're talking about here. There's the inflation of, hey, there's so many, so many points being scored now. The games are 150 to 152 and and Luka Doncic is 73. That's a, a certain type of inflation. There's that, like where the league is prioritizing certain parts of the game that they want to see. But the title of the most inflated era in NBA history which is what so many people are declaring the modern game to be. Who deserves that title now that we've done our investigation? Uh, The era that we're most nostalgic about. (laughs) It's the Jordan era. (laughs) It's our childhoods, man. The Alan Parsons Project, the Bulls, um, the Dream Team. The 80s and the 90s. The Magic, Larry. That's the pure league, right? Back when men were men and were earning every point and every block, (laughs) except for when a guy in a media guide tells you, actually, I was boosting, literally inflating the numbers because um, this whole thing has been show business in a way um, that was quite real. See, I knew they had to get there and they got there. Oh, man. The story wasn't just told it was sold to us the story of Jordan I saw this documentary on Michael Jordan and it was really based on the shoe uh, the creation of the Air Jordan and how that was neatly tied into the growth of basketball Uh, attached to it so much that as popular as basketball was becoming the shoe was going right along with it for the ride and vice versa Like the shoe was bringing the culture, bringing the streets, bringing a whole new energy to the game, bringing this new superstar and the game was growing from it. And the game was growing as it was going from tape delay, like expanding, like they didn't even have 30 teams back then. And all of that was just going together. Now, when you're going through that, it's just like when your children are, are getting taller. You notice it, but you don't really detail it or notice it. Then somebody, your auntie walks up to you. You ain't seen her in a while. She says, oh, that boy got big, right? And you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I got to buy new shoes every other month. But at the same time, those incremental steps are not noticed or properly recorded. But then all of a sudden, we just make this great exaggeration or big assumption that this is the best even though it had to go through its growth cycle. Right now, we're going through another growth cycle with these guys today, and we're not recognizing it. We're not recognizing truly that there are seven foot three, seven foot five guys who got wop wops. (laughs) Like they out there wop wopping on people with handles, with step backs, hitting trays. When there was a day where the best three point shooter in the world shot three three three-pointers a game. Yes, salute. Larry Bird back then. Now, stop playing with me. Oh, it was a different era. That's the point. So, either you just say it was a different era and seal your lips, shut it, or do not, don't, don't you start comparing. Don't you start comparing. All right, because I know that DeLorean look fresh. But that Tesla got it. <laughs> that Tesla got it, y'all. So, I just look at the errors. I just laugh like, man, it, to me, I don't even argue. That's why I don't go to the barbershop, even though I need to cut right now. I don't go to the barbershop because I'm not going to argue over something we can't objectively resolve. But trust me, I know which one is better. I know which one is the best. I know which one is being inflated. I get it. I live through it. Just like in football, 
You don't hear me up here saying, oh, 2001 NFL football is the best. Nah, son. <laughs> nah, son. I could take Ray Lewis. Yeah, I could take uh, some of these guys that played at that time. But, dog, do not think. Do not, do not think. If you ran the 2000, who was that? The, the, the Rams. If you ran the Rams out there and they had to play the Chiefs, I think the Rams will beat Chiefs. <laughs> Give me a better champion. Uh, no, no, not this year's Chiefs. So maybe the other Chiefs. Uh, that's interesting, huh? I just think the air is better now. Why would I think that San Francisco would beat the Rams, but then the Rams would beat the Chiefs? Something wrong with me. All right, y'all beat it up in the comments right there because I want to know the era. Are you with this era? This era is just better. Come on, let it go. It's all right. I can still wear Jordans and love this era more. Or are you one of those? No, no, no. Still got on a velvet sweatsuit, right? He still got on Sergio Tacchini with your Jordan. Somebody, oh, no, no. Back in the 88, it was the best. It's the best. Neck all tight. 88 was the best. Tell me what y'all think. Beat it up in the comments. Simple as that. All right. Now, let's talk about the NFL Combine because my ass needed it. And people be talking about it like, uh, it's unnecessary. Uh, or what does it do? Now, this is my dog. This is Darnell Smith. You know, remember Darnell from uh, Speak for Yourself with Jason Whitlock. That was like our nephew, I guess, or cousin. I don't know what the hell. Uh, but that's my dog, right? But Darnell, shut your... <laughs> I don't even know if Darnell went to the combine. I don't think he did. But boy, y'all better stop talking about that combine. Like, the combine doesn't matter. <sighs> he had a rant. And he basically went on and said, is it a complete waste of time to go to the combine? He didn't ask a question. He actually gave us the answer. Let's listen to Darnell talk about that damn combine. Hey, what's going on, y'all, man? Welcome to the first edition of Car Rides with Big Smitty. Hey, listen, Big Smitty. the NFL Combine and Pro Days are all a waste of time. I said it. I'm sorry. I know you've been thinking it. I'm just the first one to actually go out here and say it. Y'all looking at the wrong thing, man. Watch the tape. Watch the field. Watch the Why I got to go out here and, and, and run my fastest 40-yard dash and broad jump and vertical jump. None of these things are literally used in the game of football. Yeah, you're running. Yeah, you're jumping. Duh. Obviously, duh, so y'all. Of course, I get that. that my point you're being is you you're not just running a 40-yard dash as fast as you can. When, when are you doing that? You're not jumping up extremely as high as you possibly can. You're not broad jump. Watch the tape. Did I catch the ball? Did I make the tackle? Did I get the sack? Did I get a TFL? Did I block for my guy? Did I, like, watch the tape. The film don't lie. The eye in the sky don't lie. It <laughs> never has, never will. Come on, y'all. <laughs> Did you get in the accident? <laughs> God damn. Oh, man. I always crack it up when I see somebody filming when they driving. I'm like, texting and driving is bad. Filming and driving? Oh, man, lock his ass up for life. Oh, man, love Darnell. Um, I disagree with Darnell, though. Let's go. Um, he even disagreed with himself. He literally said, when do you ever run a 40 or jump your highest? I mean, you do, but you don't. <laughs> What's your V? Okay, there's two levels to this conversation. The first one is the necessity of the combine, and I'm going to give it to you real. I'm going to try not to joke my way through this. Okay, it's pretty obvious that small school players need to combine to level the playing field. When you don't have the film, when you played against Yale and Harvard like I did, or D2, D3 players, you go to the combine to show that you have the same athleticism, the same talents as someone from a big school. So a big assumption is when you go to smaller schools or lesser divisions, you're not as good. Well, the combine can show you, ah, maybe that good player at the big school is hiding behind the school, hiding behind the mother five stars and four stars. Combine. Oh, now I can see this guy can move even better than this guy. So the first box you check is literally, are you good enough? Are you capable athletically to make it to the NFL and do something? Oh, that doesn't matter? Well, if that doesn't matter, why don't we just go around, find people who know football, but are athletically challenged and can't compete? Oh, they know the game. They play the game, but they ain't good enough. Why? What separates you in football first and foremost is not your knowledge. It's not how crafty you are. What separates you is, boy, whoo, he can move. Woo, he's strong. Woo, that boy big. Come on, y'all. You see it purely on the smaller levels. Pop Warner, flag football. If you fast, 
Who the, who the MVP of your team? The fastest kid. Usually. 98% of the time when you're young is who's fastest. Then you get to high school. Who's fastest? Who got size? Who's a man child? Come on, y'all. We still recruit 99% of the man childs and the fast kids, right? The physically gifted ones. And then we're going to sprinkle in some guys that are just crafty that know the game. You get to college, it starts to go from this to this. It starts to get there, right? You start to level those elevators. You get to the pros, then we're going to have to have both. You're going to have to be physically gifted, and come on, y'all, be real. You're going to have to know this. You're going to have to know the crap, know the game. Combine, for me, when I didn't have the film, and I worked out every offseason with guys who went to big schools. They were my homeboys. We went to school, high school together. We all in L.A. together. Oh, meet me at Valley Ridge. Meet me at Sand Dunes. Meet me at Crenshaw. Meet me at Dorsey. Let's go. You see them? We working out. Then I go to Columbia. You go to USC. You go to Cal. You go to Miami. And they thinking you better than me. Hey, come here. Hey, evaluator. Come here. Scout, come here. You need to go watch them work out together. Wiley bigger than them. Wiley faster than them. Wiley stronger than them. Why he go to Columbia? But I'm just telling you. That's how it was. I knew that every offseason. They knew it. We used to compete. It wasn't like we were mad at each other. We were trying to sharpen our knives against each other. Then we go to my school. No media attention. No camera crews. Them. Then and then. Then and then. All right. Then we get to the combine. I'm looking at them. They looking at me. Let's go. This ain't that offseason workout like before. This is something different. And then all of a sudden, evaluators were like, wait a minute. And I know y'all thinking that's just talent. That's just talent conversation. But the thing is, it's not. When you are around 10 other dudes on the football field that are that talented, you ain't got to do as much. Because he did his job and exceeded expectations. I did my job, exceeded expectations. All of that happens, it's this much space you got to cover. He going sideline, sideline, you going sideline, sideline. Meanwhile, for me, respectfully, I had to cover for some of my teammates. So I'm getting double, triple team, and I got to cover for you if we going to make that play. You fell down because you're not as good. You're not as talented. You're not as gifted. You got blown off the ball. You're not, as, you're not going pro. My nose tackle at Columbia ain't going pro. So he getting blown off the ball. Guess what I got to do? Not only shed my block, look out for the double, but still go make the play. Combine gives evaluators the understanding that, oh, that's what had to happen in that situation. He went to a small school. Don't mean he's a small time player. That's part one. Here's part two why I love the combine. Because it actually measures real stuff. Don't believe me? Forget the NFL combine. Every player in the world should do this from the day they start playing sports. We do it in our house. Figure out what you can do. Push-ups when they first start. Jumping jacks, right? 40. All these objective tests. And every single year you're playing sports, measure yourself against that baseline objective number. So if the first day uh, you're eight years old and you're out there playing flag football, how many push-ups can you do? 11. When you're eight years old, you can do 11. When you're nine, how many can you do? This is your combine. When you're nine, I did 14. When you're 10, you just see the numbers. Why does that matter? Because if you are lucky enough to go pro, this is the best secret you can have. Best thing you can do. It's a secret, but people know now. These athletic facilities know it now. When you are a rookie, 25 reps. No, I use my numbers. All right, when you're a rookie, 35 reps on bench press, right? You ran a 4-6-1 in your pro day. Okay, that's it. Second year, come here, Wiley. Come here. Oh, you was in the NFL, got beat up a little bit rookie year? Let's see you run a 4-6-1. Oh, you slower? Oh, you faster. Come here, Wiley. You did 35. Do 36. Do 37. And if not, most people don't even test. It ain't most people fail the test against themselves. They don't even take the test against themselves anymore. They go to the combine. Literally, I know hundreds, if not thousands of pros who say this. When the last time you ran a 40, homie? Man, when we ran it at the combine. (laughs) Imagine testing yourself against yourself 
every single year. So when they start to see the incline or the decline, you already know. You already got it measured, at least in talent, at least athletically. It's so smart. So that's the second reason. It's an objective test. So let me see, because when you're 21 and you're 28, whole different animal. Oh man, I used to do 35, now I'm doing 29. Also, I'm watching me get blown off the ball just a little bit more than I used to. Hmm, I wonder if those two are correlated. So I love the combine for what it is. Look, I'm not going to grab a guy who can't play and all of a sudden draft him first overall. First of all, you're not getting, you're not even going to the combine. They don't take that many people. It's an invitation only. They're going after the best of the best. I like it. It's just an objective measure to level the playing field, especially for smaller players, small time programs. But more importantly, it gets you an opportunity to measure yourself against yourself. Course game film matters. And you got to do those things. Combine game film. Now you got you a draft prospect. So love you, Smitty, but got to disagree with you. What do y'all think? Y'all with Smitty or y'all with me? Is the combine a waste of time? I made some strong arguments, didn't I? Uh, what do you think about his take? And what would you do differently in the combine? Oh, that's a good question. Only thing I would do differently is. Nah, I would do some single leg, maybe. They don't do single leg squats. They do no squats. They do Cybex machine. At least they did when I did it. Uh, and that's good enough. Yeah, you don't want people to squat, squat max. So Cybex machine. I ain't changing the combine. Maybe make it go in Vegas. That's the only thing I would do. <laughs> Take it from Indy. Let's stop. All right, let's get into this conversation. Last one. Oh, man. Good conversation here about culture vultures, right? Versus black culture vultures. Um, I am a hater of when something has to have black or white. Like, you know what I mean? I hate, look, I'm going to tell y'all right now. I hate all these months. Like last month was Black History Month. This is Women's History Month. I don't hate black people and I don't hate women. <laughs> Duh. I just hate how we be like, all right, this month is March 1st. And now we're going to, what are we going to do? Celebrate them? You don't celebrate them the other 11 months? No, we're going to really celebrate them. What that mean? I really, really love you. Do you love me or not? I don't need the extras because the extras ain't enough. Ooh, that's a wildism. The extras ain't enough. Ah, so I don't get caught up in all this, but I notice like when we say culture vultures, we're usually talking about someone outside the black race or outside the race we're talking about. But now they talking about black culture vultures like inside. Remember when Andre said uh, 3K said uh, all all kin folk ain't skin folk. Or all skin folk ain't kin folk. That's what he said. Who didn't know that? <laughs> all skin folk ain't kin folk. Everybody grows up traditionally in the neighborhood with people that look like them, right? Like most black people live in a black neighborhood, white people live in a white neighborhood. Back in when I was growing up. Now it's a little bit different. I, I will admit the boundaries are coming down. But, all right, so guess what? When I got beat up going home from school every day, I wonder who did that. <laughs> It wasn't no white people. It was a black person, right? So to put black on culture vultures, you're a little bit late. <laughs> We've been hurting each other since I've been born. And that happens to every single race. White people hurt white people more than they hurt black people. Black people hurt black people more than they hurt white people. Come on, y'all. This ain't new. But this is new because now they're talking about it with the music, the entertainment, etc. So let's listen to uh, my man D. And Jason Whitlock talk about culture versus and black culture vultures. The rap music, it really doesn't have any influence over the kids. And, you know, it's no different than a movie or a TV show. You know, little kids singing my booty hole brown, my that, that that's harmless. Mm -hmm. what, do you, what do you say to people that are in that <laughs> denial? I feel sorry for them. And if you're not black and you're saying that, when I've seen the impact that this has had on our culture, then you're a culture vulture. But now we gotta start getting to the point to where we say, well, you can be a black culture vulture as well. But man, music reaches people in a way that your parents, your teachers, your pastors, and your coaches can't. I can't name you not one sermon from my pastor from 20 years ago, but I can rap you all the rap lyrics of my favorite songs from 20 years ago right now. Stop playing with me, man. 
I ain't playing with you, big dog. I love what you said there. Not in fullness, but I love what you said there. Okay. I've noticed this. And he just did it again. That if something hurts, something's harmful, instead of just saying, ouch, we want to see who did it so we can say, ouch, louder or quieter. You notice that? Because he literally said, the music is bad. And if you're a white person doing it, then that's really bad. But if you're a black person doing it, now we got to say that's bad too. How about it's the same? <laughs> like, like playing basketball, my kids, I watch them, I coach them. If a black player fouls you or your friend fouls you, is that different than somebody you don't know fouling you? Like, why do you look at it different? I want y'all to answer that for real. I don't do that. But I know people that do that. He just did it to the point where like, why does it matter and who cares who they are that did it? If they did it, they did it, right? If somebody come up to me and slap me, do I care if it was a white person or a black person? And if you answer that differently, maybe you ain't been slapped. <laughs> Ooh, wait. Like you talking about, oh, he slapped me because he racist, because he white. So, okay, that's fine. Let's use your words against you. Why the black person slap you? Because he hate me. No, no, oh, no, 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 he don't hate me. He, he, I did something to him. You ain't do nothing to the white dude he just slapped you? In 2024? Okay, let's stop. So that, I always catch that. I'm like, why y'all measuring degrees of like result? Like, dog, if you mess with me, when that trucker was honking at me this morning, <laughs> do you think I looked up to see if he was a white truck driver or a black truck driver? I just heard, mah, mah. I was like, man, look, you ain't gonna hit me, so what we doing here? <sighs> All right, so that part is the only part I really took exception to. Other than that, the music part. I, I disagree, but I don't take exception to it. Why? And I'm using myself as a case study. My experience is my expertise. I will admit that music gets me into different moods, different modes. I got this playlist called Heart, like Heart. It always makes me feel good. Every single song on there makes me feel good. I usually listen to it in the mornings or when I have company over that's chilling. Now, I got my mid-school playlist. That's my era, 80s, 90s. Um, they curse. I don't listen to it around the itty-bitties. I will admit, it gets me a little more pregame, a little more hustler, baller, gangster, cat pillar. I ain't about to smoke nobody, but I'm closer than I was when I was listening to my heart playlist. Can't lie. However, to put it on music is interesting because I like to put stuff on sports media for talking bad about athletes. Then all of a sudden I'm like, let's see what happens. Look at the culture of which we don't respect athletes the same. So why don't I do that with music? I tell you why. Because music, I'm already acknowledging it's a performance. I'm already acknowledging this is not who you are. This is not what you are. You can literally be anything through music. So therefore, I'm not trusting it. What athletics, you can't. If you sorry, sorry, you're not going to be great. You can be good a game or two, but you're not going to be great. Right? And if you truly great, you may suck a game or two, but you ain't going to be sorry. Athletics is realer. That's why I protect it differently than I do music. I really don't care what they say because one, I know they just saying it, not doing it, athletics, but two, and actually speak louder than the words, but two, I don't have to listen to it. There are two, there's so many songs, uh, whatever. I can just tune you out. But when I tune you in, tune in to you, I should say, do you have me? No. I memorize it. I ride to the rhythm of it. I feel it. But the influence, it stops short of that. Why does it stop short of that? Because I don't trust what you're saying. I don't trust you. You think every kid does? I was a kid when rap was around. I did not trust Ice Cube. I loved Ice Cube. I love how poetic he was. I love how he described what I was going through, but I didn't trust him. You know why I didn't trust him? Because his t-shirts were too crispy. 
When I watched them on Yo MTV Raps and I saw them, they looked too crispy. They lokes didn't have any scratches on them. Y'all really want to know. I'm looking at them head to toe. I'm like, them shoes just got out the box. See, this is what's funny. Now, if you're really from it, you can see through it. I'm like, Easy E, oh, you ain't 13. Thought you were until I look. You ain't 13. Oh, yeah, you from it, but now you ain't in it. Not the same. Not the same. You can tell. Then all of a sudden, you know the real from the fake. So why are you getting faked out by the fake? Music is different in movies. You know in a movie, like, the, there's zero trust factor in a movie that Denzel is actually the cop in Training Day. Like, right? You watch that, you're like, entertain me, Denzel. Nah, that ain't you. What was his name again? Damn, I forgot his name. You know damn well none of that is him. So why y'all think the music artist is? Right? Okay. I don't like crazy rap for my kids because I want to give it to them in doses and help them grow. Really why is because <laughs> they don't know the real as much as I had to deal with the real. So I'm going to bring it to them a little different. I don't know why people think music is to blame. I just don't. Y'all can educate me. I'll, look, I'll learn to turn my head. If it's wrong, it's wrong. It's right, it's right. But I don't blame music. I can't blame music. I know, I, I listen to you. I'm knowing you telling me something that could be real and fake. I used to love listening to Too Short, especially when he first came out. I told y'all that story before. First time I heard Too Short, I'm on Crenshaw Slauson. Dude gets out. I think he had a white caddy. He jumped out the white caddy, and I never heard bass like that before. You got to remember, I used to hear the bass that hit you like this. You know, uh, Rick Rubin bass, Beastie Boy bass, Run DMC, Dumb Girl. Doom, 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 boom, boom, boom. Oh, shit! Right hearing that, like, golly! And then I heard short. Wait a minute. Did somebody wet the speakers? Because it was drunk. Dun, dun. They were going on, on, on. It was that bass guitar mixed in with that bass. That sub with boom, 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 boom. I went up to this dude, gangster as he could be. I said, Excuse me, sir, what you listening to? <laughs> he said, Oh, this that too short. This dude It's too short. He's from the bay. I was like, Oh, thank you, sir. Got back in my car after I pumped that gas. And then I bought the tape. Of course, you know I did. I remember how it all began, and I did never, ever, ever, ever think I was going to start pimping. <laughs> Not one time. Not one time. Did I ever think I was going to start pimping? So come on, y'all. Miss me with that. Um, you don't trust music. I hope you don't. And I know these kids don't either. They just over there doing this dance. They just doing this, whatever the hell they be doing. They, man, stop it. Miss me. All right, so the culture vultures and black culture vultures, the last part, um, We're not on the corner. We're not beatboxing. And this is sad, but it's real. It's sad because in all things, including athletics, the ones that can do it are not the ones that can get it done. I'm a football player. All these football players I know, basketball players, we can do it, but we got to go to a league, ownership, something already constructed, an entity to get it done. Because of the history of this country, we know who had a head start, and then we also know who has the interest to get into that. You gotta have money. What you got, Magic Johnson and Warwick Dunn, only owners in the NFL that are not just old white people or young white people, <laughs> you know what I mean? And Javier in Houston, Latino. Come on, y'all. It's just, a, look, I'm not, you can't change how this race started. You can't go back. That's how I did. And they ain't letting go. They are going to protect those interests like you would if you had that head start, right? It is. So I don't want to make that a race conversation, but the point is <sighs> rapper, 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 you're on the corner. 
Oh, dog, you got flaws. Oh, you different. Like corrupt. Corrupt when he used to battle Snoop over there at the Palladium and stuff like that, right? When Game used to go to every club and I used to see Game before he even was Game and he just started busting a freestyle. What? I used to live it, bro. And I'm like, damn. When he got on, where'd he go? First, he was supposed to, I think, go to Puffy or something. Then he ended up going to Dre. Who Dre with, though? Jimmy Iovine. There it is. <laughs> like, is that a culture vulture or like, dog? I mean, I be on it all night, all day. Hey, 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 hey. That's how the game go, man. So now, if you're an actor, let me just give you some, some comps. You're an actor, and you out here on Sunset, you know what you can see, and I've seen it a few times. Guess who just walked into the gym? Who was that? Tyler Perry? Yeah, he just walked in the gym. I've seen Tyler Perry at the gym many times back in the day when I used to go to the gym. <laughs> you can tell I don't go now. Um, yeah. So there are opportunities out there for us, whatever you want to call us is, you and y'all. Um, the culture vulture part, I do know what it looks like and I know what it is. It's a difference. Um, but if you foul me, I don't care who you are. I don't care where you're from. I don't care what you look like. I'm still calling foul. And the way it hurt is the way it hurt. Ain't got nothing to do with who you are. Just the way I received it. So tell me what y'all think, man. We had, he went a lot of good places. I love that. Um, and that's why I love Whitlock's show because fearless is the word. Um, cause he just, he just, he look at the cliff. He's like, I'm gonna jump. I'm gonna go into these real topics and to go into it with real people. Um, no matter if he sticks to landing or not, he jumped. And that's what I appreciate. Somebody who goes and makes the decision, not always the results. So, uh, tell me what you think about it. Culture vultures and black culture vultures and rap. Does it really influence you? First of all, I'm judging your ass if rap influences you. <laughs> just like if you smoke cigarettes, I judge you. Yep. I do. Um, if you got a bunch, if you got fake ass lips and like, like they out here and you look all plastic, I judge you. Yep. Yep. Um, if you say the N word, I judge you. Um, yep. And if you, <laughs> if you listen to rap music and think, oh my God, I'm about to do it. I judge you. So it's all right. You can live without my judgment. It's all good. Uh, but tell me what you think and what you agree with and disagree with. All right. Coming up next on Never Shut Up, we got a special guest. He's back. We're going to focus on some comments and hit you with a wildism. Next, I'll never shut up. Brinks TV and Reach TV. And I'm going to start taking all these old episodes off YouTube. Y'all got to go to Brinks for that, boy. <laughs> Welcome back to Never Shut Up. It's your boy, Marcellus Wiley. I'm not alone, but you don't see him right now. Yes, we're going to talk to my guy, pro football doc, Dr. David Chow, after you guys log on to projecttransition.org and support the itty-bitties in the community. How you think you got so fresh? Somebody looked out for you. Well, I'm here to look out for all the itty-bitties. Make sure you go to projecttransition.org and lead some support. All right, give me some support, damn it. It's time to bring in my guy, pro football doc, Dr. David Chow, who has seen me naked so many times just because he's a surgeon. <laughs> oh, man, my guy, he's fixed me more than most. I uh, love you, brother. How you doing and where are you? I'm trying to stay warm here in Montana. The kids are out on the ski slope right now. I'm in the lodge here. Oh, that's love. Family vacation in Montana. Do you like to ski or is it the family likes to ski and they drag you along? 
I'm so old now. I think the family likes to ski, and I like to see the, the little six-year-old is actually doing it this time, really getting out there, you know, arms out like an airplane, skiing away. And uh, so that their, their little faces is what it's about. Like, I, I don't challenge myself skiing anymore. A long time ago, I decided I don't want to fall anymore, so I just try and do cruiser <laughs> runs. For a while, I did snowboarding because, you know, X game stuff, but uh, that's too much yeah. falling, too much work. Cruiser runs. Man. I hope they don't have to use you for both roles, father and doctor. So hopefully the doctor stays in the lodge and the father gets to have fun out there. Well, let's talk, Doc. It's a lot going on. I'm looking at our topics right now. I just want to start with the combine because so many memories, fond memories, good memories for me, small school player going to the combine. I needed the combine. There's a lot of conversation right now about the combine. How relevant is it? How does it translate? But we saw something. We've never seen before at the combine. Shall you explain? Yeah, I've been to 20 plus combines over my time in Indy. And, you know, the the shrimp cocktail at St. Elmo's, it used to be the only place. Now, Indy is so big. But right, right. it's unprecedented. We've never had anyone refuse physicals at the combines. In my 20 plus years, never and never since. This is the first time Caleb Williams is doing so. It is his prerogative to do so. It's just very unusual. You have to understand, when John Elway or Eli Manning was trying to manipulate themselves in the draft process and manipulate teams, they did not refuse physicals. So it's curious to hear Caleb Williams' reasoning why. Now, I think what he's saying is, why should I get poked and prodded by 32 teams? There's no way the Arizona Cardinals or, or L.A. Chargers are going to draft me. There's only a few teams. So I'll yeah. do my physicals when I do my team visit. The problem with that is, besides, you know, you're bucking the system and how do people look at that? Maybe as a good mm -hmm. way, you're a leader. Mm -hmm. But the medical exams are not simple. And, you know, can you really do an EKG and a stress test and all those other things? You're going to do it for three different teams for uh, Chicago and then Washington and then who else? It's an interesting process. If I were advising Caleb Williams, I would have said, do the general medical physical at the combine because it's complicated and make sure there's nothing else going on. And then do one orthopedic physical. Let's say with the Bears team doctor, declare it to be 10 a.m. and let the other teams watch right then you get it out of the way you don't have to waste your time with the testing and you're going with the flow other athletes have made modifications to the process before for example if you're coming off an acl tear they may say an acl surgery the athlete may say my doctor said i can't be examined but i'll come back for recheck combines and no one downgrades them for that or if you have recent shoulder surgery and the surgeon says look we don't want 32 teams poking and prodding the shoulder will let one team prod the shoulder and everyone else can watch. So there's ways to work around the system, but just look, medicals at combines are the most important thing, everyone says, and now you're not doing them. So it's a, just an interesting yeah. way to approach things. Well, you're not going to be able to advise Caleb Williams, as I know Caleb Williams this much. I see him around. I know some people around him got to meet him and his father because you're not his daddy because his daddy is running the show. Caleb Williams doesn't even have an agent. I don't think this dude has already made more money than he gonna make next year in college. So he's just going to the beat of his own drum. Um, I, I don't like all these red flags, but talk about the poker game. Yeah, that they always play with the top pick. Yeah, you know, how are the, the teams going to react to it? I don't know. They may like the moxie or they may say, this is the face of our franchise and this is what we want. And I get it. You know, uh, if you're an exceptional athlete, they make exceptional rules for you. But as a yep. leader of the team, is this what you want? I don't know. It's the Bears in Washington and other teams will have to answer that question. But it's certainly unusual. Look, I don't begrudge Caleb Williams' dad for asking about the equity in an NFL team. I don't begrudge that because Why not? it's a question that he doesn't know the answer to. Clearly, the answer is no way. It's illegal and it's not going to happen. And I do think some agents threw him under the bus because they knew that they weren't going to advise or get 
to represent Caleb Williams, that and they part. whispered to media that he asked about this. I mean, I guess if you don't ask, you can't get. So I don't blame Dad for asking. So I'm not trying to throw Caleb Williams and his dad under the bus. To ask that question, they didn't know. It's okay. I think the agents did him dirty by leaking that information. But here, medical, and I'm not bagging on him for it. I'm just saying it's very unusual, and no one has ever done that before. Well, how about this? All right, so you don't ask, you don't get. What about these head coaches? If you don't go, what do you know? Like, there's head coaches that don't even go to the combine. So tell me, what sense does that make? You're running a team, and you're not even going to check out all the prospects? Well, here's what I would say to that. I think on the media side, that story's been a 7 or 8 out of 10. To me, it's about a 1 or 2 out of 10, and here's why. In my time at the combines, I never met with the head coach when we were there. We always met with the GM after physicals were done, the GM and the scouts and so forth. Remember, this is a scouting combine. This is not a playmaking scheme combine, right? And head coaches don't have final say on the players. Now, Sean McVay is still sending all of his assistant coaches. So it's not like the Rams aren't going. It would be news if a GM decided not to go, okay? But all GMs are going. Sean McVay is not going. But he still can participate in some of the interviews because that's all they get out of it. Remember, with COVID, everything was done by Zoom in all the interviews. So you can still get interviews with some top prospects and have some input. I don't think it's that, that big of a deal that some head coaches are deciding not to go. All their underlings, all their assistant coaches are going, and you know how it works, Marcellus. You can't walk through the lobby. You can't go anywhere. People are selling you stuff. Uh, can I be your assistant coach next year? Can you do this for me, yeah. this, that, the yeah. other? Sometimes yeah. Superman doesn't want his cape tugged on, you know, so I don't blame him. Yeah, I get you. I mean, the combine is its a thing. It's a spectacle for some. It's like too much, and I understand that. So. It makes sense on that accord because if you're not going to have ultimate decision making power, what are you doing in that process and putting yourself through that burden? Put yourself through that burden is a transition to what we're going to talk about right now. Court storming. Those players, poor players, put themselves in a the position and, and then 2,000 people running at them and me, the athlete, still thinks I can win this battle. But we're starting to see these players ain't winning these court storming battles. Where do you side on court storming? Should we ban it or not? Well, you know, I mean, you want to have fun with the game, but you also have to keep athletes safe. Now, for, fortunately, I don't think uh, Filipowski was able, was actually injured. He was scared and hurt a little bit. Uh, there has to be a happy medium here somewhere. Hey, this is my offer. Why should it? hundreds of people run on it and I understand that and uh, there has to be a happy medium but thankfully I don't think he was injured significantly how about this doc if you watch that film and one of the things I'm gonna start doing is breaking down video slow-mo micro movements he started that like look he didn't start the court storming uh it's the fact that they lost but he actually pushed show somebody at first kind of like move and then they was like, oh, you forgot. I got friends with me. And they just ran his ass up out of there. So, hey, look, if you don't really want the smoke, don't be around the smoke, bro. Get out of there. No, I hear you. But, but, but Marcellus, in the NFL, you had at least a five or ten minute cooling off period before That's reporters true. were left let in the Very locker room. Point. This is not yeah. even five seconds, and you have people running on the court. So who can blame him? And the other thing is, I think you can argue with self-defense, and I think his knee starts to get run into – at as he has his arm up starting to to push yeah. and it's it, you know i don't think he was being the aggressor was he mad yes i think he was mad was he protecting himself probably but there, there wasn't even a five second cooling off period for him so I, I i can forgive that all right great point now let's speak about the aggressor here we don't know i got my thoughts they've been on both sides the cam newton fight uh, I had a friend who was there who gave me an extended version clip of it that was different than the one that was going around traditional social. And in that one, looked like Cam might have put his hands on dude first, despite the dude obviously having words for Cam before and another one of them having a social post about Cam the day before. But just break down the Cam Newton fight well, from your perspective. My first question, Marcel, since you got an extended video, did the hat ever come off? 
That hat Hell must be nah, super glued. Something. I mean, that hat that was yeah. that thing stayed on throughout the whole scuffle. How did that happen? I don't know, but but that's my first question. Right. If the right. hat came right. up, but here's the reality about Cam. He is tough to bring down. He actually was training in San Diego when he was getting ready for the combines, and had a small groin hip flexor issue. We got an MRI. I'll let you in on this story here. We get the MRI. The radiologist calls me and says, "Who is this guy?" I said, what do you mean? It's Cam Newton. Obviously, he didn't really know football. You know what he said? He goes, this guy's not human. He has the biggest psoas muscles of anyone he's ever seen on his pelvis Damn. MRI. And the psoas Damn. is a hip flexor muscle good for high knee, hip flexion, high knee running. And Cam yeah. Newton was one of the best ever at that. And that's why you can't <laughs> bring that guy down, you know, whatever the scuffle is. So Cam Newton is a beast. That the hat may be a bigger beast. I don't know what that story was all about. But, <laughs> yeah, you know, shout out uh, to George Whitfield. He used to train with George down there in San Diego. I remember yes, he those did. Days. Huh? Yeah, that's great. And look, all I know is you can't have Cam Newton. And it reminds me of like some karate flicks, you know, or you watch Jet Li and sometimes you'd be like, why don't they all just rush him at the same time? You want to know why? Because he, him, Cam Newton himself is like six five six six. 240, 50, like it's a different animal. And that's me, my big ass saying that he is a different dude. And they all were caught in doubt. They didn't want to blitz the A gap because it was like, nah, don't do it. And he wore their ass out. It was hilarious. All right, let me get you out of here on this, Doc. Right now, I just need to know what is going on with a Jones fracture like I had with my man Kool Aid, Alabama's cornerback. Have the same thing I had. Now, is he going to have the same recovery I had? Because thanks to you and the screw you put in my foot, it went by in like a couple weeks. I was good to go. Yeah, and he, you, you were a pro bowler that year, uh, first year in uh, San Diego there. Yeah, this is what happens at Combines. We, you know, back in the day, Michael Crabtree was discovered to have a Jones fracture. So it's not the end of the world for, for Kool-Aid, right? He's an Alabama corner there. But interestingly enough, he's going to wait to have surgery after his pro day. He's not allowed to work out at combines because he doesn't pass the physical because of the Jones fracture. Okay. Otherwise, okay. he probably would work out at combines and then have the surgery. So he's waiting till his pro day to work out and then have the surgery. It's a stress fracture that he's been playing through that does need to be fixed. Here's the thing. If he's graded the same as somebody else, that other person will get drafted ahead of him only because you're not going to be there for the offseason program as a rookie learning the defensive scheme. And so your first year may not be as good. So he will get a small downgrade, even though we expect him to have a full recovery just because of the mispractice time in OTAs and offseason program leading up to it. And also the higher chance of the other side. He's draftable. He's going to still get drafted close to where he was. But Ty will go to the other guy in this case with this medical. All you right. Appreciate you, Doc, man. I know it's a Friday. As Coach used to always tell me, get your head out the parking lot. Fridays are tough to focus. And you're yeah. there to ski and be with the families, man. So get back to the fam, bam. Give them my love, and we'll talk next week, brother. All right. Thank you. He already left. Okay. <laughs> I told you his head was in the parking lot. Man, all them combine stories. Look. We're going to talk about the combines a lot because I needed them. I, I had to get it. I had to go through the combine. So respect to all those prospects out there trying to make it pay day. Go get it, guys. All right, let's phone go some comments. Phone go some comments. Yeah, let's talk about Cam Newton again. Let's talk about this. I thought it was funny that you mentioned the outfits. As I was listening to Cam, I kept thinking that he looked like an LGBT pilgrim. Now that's wrong. You know it's LGBTQ. Don't forget the Q. <laughs> However, besides that, I respect him for giving back to the community. Yeah, I think that's the, and this is wrong to say, that's the mixed message that people are receiving from Cam. You're like, oh, he's doing good. Oh, he's a leprechaun, a big-ass leprechaun. <laughs> you know, you just, whatever reason, I'm not a fashionista. I don't care about what I really wear. I do feel good when I look fresh. I know when I do look fresh. But I'm not trying to take that much time to look fresh and I really don't care how people look at me because no one gives you compliments really anyway. So why am I getting all dapped up and then it's like, you know, nobody gonna say, oh, those are fresh. So I never I never understood why people always got into fashion. But 
Cam is into it. But when he goes to the levels he goes to, and you know, he got the scarf covering half his lip, and I'm like, <laughs> what? And then people are like, oh, you're giving back to the community. And they're still looking at the scarf. So that's the problem. All right, there is a time and place to peacock your feathers. Preach. Cam needs to learn that. In media and public, sure. Of course. Around kids, nah. Teach them that there's more honor and humility until you make it. That those feathers are earned, not given. Damn, that was a great comment. John Delina, damn, you're right. I can smell it. I haven't seen it or heard it, but I can smell it that Cam Newton is flexing a little too much in the wrong situations. I, I can see it. And it's not like so much flexing. It's just I'm not taking that from y'all. Or I'm going to show y'all how I got it. But that ain't how they going to get it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I got a maniacal side that I don't want an eight-year-old to see, right? I want an eight-year-old to see a, a, a more well-rounded, uh, fun way to work hard. I don't want him to see me throwing up. There's a time where I had, I, I'm literally going to work out to throw up. And there's literally a place I'm going to walk, and then when I get there, I'm going to run, and then after it, I can't walk. You know what I mean? Like, you can't sell that to eight-year-olds. They be like, ah, uh, football ain't for me. And I think Cam goes to these camps sometimes, and he giving them the MVP, I'm still the Don Dada Cam. And they like, we just want to make it, Cam. <laughs> like, any way we can get there, show us that way, not just your singular way. So peacocking is a great way to express that. If Cam talked to people the way he talked to CW in that interview, then I understand the reasons he didn't so much drama. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking too. Why am I sinking? I think that Cam is, uh, he's still on the field. <laughs> he's, stuck on there. he's still getting it. And them cats are starting to respond to that. All right, here we go. Uh, let's get to white corner. Never really realized there wasn't a white corner. Not right now. Jason Seahorn, when I played, but not right now. We're about to have another one. Ain't that crazy? No, let me stop. This is a mistake in media, and I just caught myself. Thank you. Without fact checking, I'm just like, yeah, I ain't seen one, so there ain't one. That ain't right. There, how many corners on each team? Five at least? At least? Times 32 teams? 160? I ain't watched, I ain't seen 160 people walk by saying they play corner. So there may be some white corners out there. Maybe they on the bench. Maybe they starting and I don't know their name, but I shouldn't have said that. Um, but I don't think there are. <laughs> I remember Ebony and Ivory from SMU, Eric Dixon and Craig James in their backfield. James, I think, played on the Patriots in 85 and made the Pro Bowl. Yeah, er oh, oh, Craig James was that dope. We know Eric Dixon, my favorite running back. Uh... That was the guy. I wanted to be Eric Dixon growing up. I was a tall, skinny running back. I thought I was going to be Eric Dixon. Then I got fat. <laughs> it's, it's changed. Clippers. Where your Clippers take to you know Shannon on your head? Oh, he talking about my Clippers? Everybody talking about my Clippers? This is the regular season. You know what's funny? You do have to have two different teams in the NBA. Regular season team, playoff team. Guarantee you, good luck beating that Clippers team that's that deep in a seven-game series. Good luck, good luck, good luck. They barely beat us, almost a buzzer beater. Well, Kawhi took a bad shot, whatever. Uh, with no Paul George and no Zubac. What? And they had everybody out there. They were full tilting. Good luck, good luck. That's all I got to say. All right, y'all know how we finish every show. We finish with a Wiley-ism. Yeah, you're lying if you're saying you're taking full responsibility. This one hit me about a week or two ago. I saw somebody, you know how it goes. Somebody get in trouble. I take full responsibility for it. And for some reason, now I've heard that two million times. You have as well. For some reason, I finally paused because as the great Thomas Sowell always says, doesn't matter how smart you are if you don't stop and think. We got to all start doing that. He said, I'm taking full responsibility for my actions. Then I was like, wait a minute. You just saying that you ain't taking full responsibility because full responsibility is not just words. It's actions, boss. And the actions would have preceded you saying you're taking full responsibility. Now, I've been guilty of that before. You ever get caught doing something? You're like, oh, the only way to get these fools off my head is to say I take full responsibility. OK, where's the mic? Ooh. Woo. Hello. 
I take full responsibility for my actions. Thank you. Walk off and be like, man, shit. <laughs> Fake old apology. You, you can't have a full, sincere apology like that, full responsibility, because be real. Part of you wanted to do it. I am a firm believer that everything that you do, you wanted to do to different degrees. Some things I want to do 100%. Some things I see my kids 100%. If I say, if my lips start to move to say iPad, 100%. If I say clean your room, 1%. And the only 1% is so they get to their iPad. So I'm like, whatever we do, dog, even if we didn't really, really, really want to do it, some part of us wanted to do it, right? You slapped the hell out of that dude for stepping on your J's. You didn't want him to step on your J's, but you wanted him to know how mad your ass was. Wow. So I'm not a big believer in this whole, I blacked out and I didn't know what I was doing. Even if you get into a fight, even if you get into an argument, people cut me off. This big old truck on the way home just now, her, her, I, I cut them off. I always cut people off. Because I'm like, if you got time to honk the horn, you got time to hit the brakes. And since you didn't hit the brakes, that means I didn't really cut you off, bro. You just mad because I got somewhere before you. Don't, don't you notice that when you're driving? I'm like, dog, if I don't hear, then I ain't cut your ass off. You good. Because I got reactions. And I know and sometimes I get mad when somebody do that to me too, but I got time to slow down. I got time to stop. But if I hit the horn, you just mad. So anyway, if, if they got out the car, oh, I was talking to the kids the other day at the school. Remember I told you that? And I, I, I was running late. So I went around and made a left turn. All illegal. I know. And I got the parking spot because I got the handicap placard because I'm hurt my hip. All right. So I'm handicapped in the spot. And I guess the lady that I made a left in front of, Wanted that spot. Oh, well, I'm there first. She literally pulls up to the side of my car. Now, normally when people do that and then I turn around with all this neck and head, <laughs> they gone. <laughs> Not her. <laughs> she was like, motherfucker, you motherfucker. And I went like this. <laughs> right? So then I'm thinking she's going to shoot me. I ain't lying. Because people get mad when you ain't mad at them. Right? People get even more mad. Oh, this fool don't... And I'm like, oh, I'm about to get smoked and trying to talk to the kids. She pull up behind me. Then I think she's going to ram me. Then she get out. She looks on the driver's side, looking at me, walks around, passenger side, still burden me. Walks to the school, giving birds to in front of the high schoolers. I'm like, now you're doing too much. She gets in line. Now, meanwhile, I walk up. I got to speak at the school. They come grab me out the line and take me right past her. As she's screaming out, you think you special? And I was like, you must be bored. That's all I gave her. I said, you must be bored. And I know she was mad at me. And then, I'm no lie, when I was walking in, I think she would go smoke me in the back of the head. I just think like that. Anyway, point being, if something went down, if I would have responded, and then I got caught, oh, you hit a woman. Oh, you did all this. I've been like, I take full responsibility for my actions. I'm sorry. Walked off like, man, shit. Y'all don't know what she did. <laughs> she deserved that. Point being, you're lying if you're saying you're taking full responsibility. We know what you wanted to do, and you did it. That'll do it for today's episode of Never Shut Up. Love you guys. Man, something really big came to our family. I want to tell y'all, but I don't think I'm going to do it. So therefore, I'll... <sighs> Here's another one I ain't going to pay off. I know who you are out there. Another teaser for you guys. We'll talk through it later. Have a great weekend. I know I am. Hers. <laughs> now we got to do a show. Stays a lot faster. <laughs> oh, I'm so honored. I'm so inspired to be here and thank Shine Global for this award uh, to be recognized for doing the right thing, to be recognized for doing good things and trying to inspire others for their own greatness. Um, I'm just a kid from Compton who uh, at an early age I had to look inside to find my opportunities because on the outside there were so many whispers and sometimes yells of I couldn't make my dreams a reality. And 
thought that was very unfortunate, but I was thankful that I never internalized that, that chorus that was around me. I was a kid that understood that you had to be greater than your greatest excuse. And I had a lot of excuses. I had a lot of reasons to have self-doubt. But I was able to develop my inner power, discover that inner power, and make sure that I showed the world exactly who I wanted to be. And it was really simple for me. It was to make my dreams a reality. There was nothing more to it. And as I now stand here, just a few miles from where I grew up, where that adversity still is strong. And as we see through these movies, that it's worldwide, not just in our locale. You see the, the suffering, you see the gangs, you see the drugs, you see the poverty. And there's always one common escape. It's that inner power, it's that ambition. It's having a voice that's louder than those surrounding voices. And I'm on a mission, a global mission, to make sure that that inner power inspires all to not only give, but to receive the blessings that come from giving. And I'm up here right now as a guy who's challenging everyone to give their three T's. That's time, that's talent, and that's treasure. Human capital, financial, whatever it may be. Let's invest in each other because we all have to coexist here together. And as I look around and I have a foundation that, that really inspires these kids to become their greatest version of themselves, and to look in the mirror to make sure that they're greater than their greatest excuse. It gives me my greatest passion. Uh, I was a kid who wanted to be a school teacher, but because of my height, weight, and speed, I became a football player. So <laughs> I took that helicopter ride up as high as I could, but as I was ascending, I never forgot that I was once one of those fork and roll kids who was shot at many times, who had to navigate around adversity every single day who had to waste so much of his brain power just trying to get home every day. And so many experiences that sometimes you become desensitized to. But in reality, that is someone else's reality. So I'm so thankful to stand in front of all of you guys as, a, as an example of the kids that we're trying to affect, the underserved, the underprivileged, those who are told that their hardships are greater than who they are. But hopefully we can inspire them all to look inward because everything they want out there is already in here. Appreciate you guys. BetUS, America's favorite sports book, where you can bet on everything, anytime. Sportsbook, casino, horse racing, live betting, and more. We have the best bonuses in the industry. That's right. Get a 125% sign-up bonus, and to celebrate our 30-year anniversary, we're giving up to 30 risk-free bets, a truck, Super Bowl tickets, and more. Don't miss out. Play smart. Join now. BetUS, where the game begins.